haha, <laughs> this video is gonna get people mad, and I know that it's why we're making it on a Saturday, or not a Saturday, it's a Sunday... What is it, evening? No. Noon! Yeah, that's when it is, that's when this video is coming out, right. Sunday at noon. But either way, today I wanted to talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs once again, and some other moves that they might have been able to go out there and consider before heading into their 2022 Stanley Cup first round defeat at the hands of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Two videos ago, we talked about how I honestly don't know where the Leafs could go. Last video, we talked about how Tyler Bertuzzi could be seen as a potential Leafs target in the eyes of Jeff Merrick. Today, we're going over onto the other side of the pond from Sportsnet over to TSN because on a recent segment on 1050, we had ourselves James Myrtle on the show who had himself a point that he wanted to make as well. We're going over onto NHL Watcher's Twitter account for the scoop once more. Thank you so much to NHL Watcher for always transcribing these radio hits. It makes it easier for me to screenshot and put it on the screen so it's easier for you to follow along. James Myrtle makes a good point on 1050. Instead of the Leafs adding a good top six forward, they added Mark Giordano, who played on the third pair, and Colin Blackwell, a fourth liner. Now, before we expand beyond that, Mark Giordano is a guy that honestly, I mean, according to all the rumors, it appears that he might return to Toronto, and he did play somewhat of a good role on the team. Sure, he wasn't a Morgan Riley, but he was still going out there and doing what it was that you want Mark Giordano to do, making veteran plays and making veteran decisions. I honestly was a pretty big fan of the Giordano acquisition. I don't know about you. He also had Colin Blackwell, who scored a very nice goal in the series as well. Even though he was a fourth liner, he is a fourth liner that plays the right way. I don't necessarily think that these additions were bad, per se, but of course, James Myrtle's point is not that they were bad, it's just they weren't good enough. The importance he's placing on this entire idea that they added these players instead of a top six forward is interesting, because he also says afterwards he would have liked the Maple Leafs to go after J.T. Miller. And I saw this and I was like, you know, that's a good video topic. We can talk about the Canucks and J.T. Miller and the Leafs, because when it comes to what Toronto should, could, or would have done... It's easy now to revise everything and say, okay, they didn't win. They didn't get themselves the clutch goal they needed to bring themselves to tie the game 2-2 in Game 7 against Andre Vasilevsky. Sure, you could debate. It already was 2-2, and they lost, but... All the Leafs needed, yet again, was a goal in overtime in Game 6. All they needed was an extra goal in Game 7 to force overtime once again. Had they just gotten another goal, they would have been in a good place. And... Players that are in the caliber of a JT Miller are more likely than not to help you out in scoring those goals, admittedly more than a Blackwell or a Giordano would help you out. Again, I didn't dislike those acquisitions, it's just JT Miller is on a completely different playing field. The guy just turned 29 years old, he's making $5.25 million for next season, that contract expires in 2023, and this year in the NHL he had 99 points in 80 games played, 32 goals, 67 assists. Back in the playoffs for the Canucks in 2019-20, he had 18 points in 17 games as they were defeated by the Vegas Golden Knights in Game 7 of the second round. That includes a Minnesota play-in series, a St. Louis first-round series where they won, and then, of course, the seven Vegas games as well. JT Miller has been nothing short of a performer for the Vancouver Canucks, a guy who is always going in there, scoring points, making plays on the power play like every other pass goes to him, and he's always racking up points because of it. You don't get to 99 points without doing something right, and he was one away with two missed games as well from becoming the NHL's, what is it, like ninth 100-point scorer this season? The problem for Toronto, if you really wanted to go out there and say, oh, Miller could have been a Leaf, they should have gone after Miller, yada, yada, yada. The fact is, Miller... Okay, the price is the problem. He is so gosh darn expensive on the market that you had all the rumors circulating about this guy saying that, oh, you know, you see a Miller trade, it's a lot more likely because he's so good and teams are going out there asking for this guy. And then partway through the season, we started saying, OK, no, it's not Miller anymore. It's actually Brock Besser, who is more on the desired end because the Vancouver Canucks really do like Miller and they might not want to keep Besser around because he's slumping. And the entire idea was that Miller was so gosh darn expensive that other teams just wouldn't really have what it takes to afford him. 
not in terms of the money, but because this guy is a 99-100 point player who is only making $5 million a season, and who did all of this on a very bad Vancouver Canucks team whose first half was absolutely abysmal, one of the worst that we had seen in NHL history. Frank Saravelli said this in March, there were teams frothing at the mouth to get Miller, but Saravelli thought the Canucks were either playing hard to get, or they were looking to make an internal decision to keep him. Now, I think in today's atmosphere, it's a lot easier to say the Vancouver Canucks are probably going to trade Miller away based off of how Rutherford has talked about the contract negotiations, but... If you were Toronto and you were trying to force away a JT Miller out of the Vancouver Canucks' hands, your pitch of prospects and picks and future would have had to be huge. So much to the point that you would be pretty much jumping the line. Because the Vancouver Canucks, in their ways of trading JT Miller, it's more likely than not that the guy's going to get traded sometime around the draft. Because in this time period, okay, all the contracts are off the books, teams are now just using the flexibility they have with draft picks and roster management to make some big trades, acquire some names. Because you got to remember, during the draft, during the offseason, there is no salary cap, technically. You're allowed to be over the cap. You're just supposed to be, in theory, under the cap by the time the regular season rolls around or whatever. Is it the preseason? Something like that. Long story short, a lot of teams that are strapped up with money and strapped up with commitment to other players will be available to trade for JT Miller. And a lot of teams that are going to go out there and try to push for the playoffs next season or try to take that next step into the second or third or fourth rounds, these guys are going to be the ones that are saying, yeah, okay, here. We got a prospect, we've got a top pick, we've got all this stuff. Give us JT because we want this guy for our playoff run in 2023. He's only making $5 million. If he gets 70, 80 points for us, then fantastic. That's what we want. If you were Toronto and you wanted to make a trade for Miller back at the trade deadline, you would have needed to have an offer that was so good that it would have made the Canucks say, okay, well... This offer is so amazing. We're getting Rodion Amirov, two firsts, and a roster replacement player like Alex Kerfoot. This is a lot better than any of the offers that we would receive from the Rangers or the Devils or the Wild or the Bruins in the 2022 draft. This is already such a good package that we just got to take this, right? That's the magnitude of a package that you would have needed to send over to Vancouver if you're Toronto, if you're Kyle Dubas trying to get JT Miller of all players, arguably the best free agent to be in the 2023 class. And I can't believe I just said that. Wow, that puts a smile on my face, acknowledging that the Vancouver Canucks have one of, if not the absolute best player that is going to be a free agent in that time frame, and arguably one of the best players, if not the best player on the trade market by the time the trade deadline rolled around. I mean, Look at all the other guys that had 100 points. McDavid, Goudreau, Huberto, Drysaddle, Kaprizov, Matthew, Stamkos, Kachuk. None of these guys were on the trade market, quote-unquote, and none of the guys after Miller were on that boat either. Marner, Yossi, Panarin, Kyle Connor, Rontanen, you could debate Patrick Kane being there, but he's making $10.5 million, so he's definitely not in the same caliber of contract value. JT Miller's the best player that was on the market, and he will be the best player playing in his prime, scoring at a 100-point pace to hit the free agent pool next year, assuming he does continue his 100-point caliber play. I mean, this is a really good player, so you're gonna have to go leaps and bounds to trade for him. It does not surprise me in the slightest that JT Miller, of all people, was not a Toronto Maple Leaf, especially when you consider how conservative Kyle was being at the trade deadline. He could have gone for another goalie. He didn't. He believed in Jack Campbell. Instead, he went with these depth pickups. Of course, Mark Giordano is a big name, so I don't want to make it seem like he is just a depth option, but he wasn't the most important player that was getting swapped around at trade deadline day. He also had, of course, Blackwell, who was a good addition for what he was, but he's no JT Miller. So, talk to the comments on your thoughts about what the Vancouver Canucks could have gotten from Toronto. Should Toronto really have made a push to get JT Miller at the trade deadline? Do you agree with Myrtle's assessment here that they should have gone for Miller? And this should have been the guy they had on their team instead of Giordano, instead of Blackwell, instead of the depth pieces they got instead? If you're a Leafs fan and you wanted to trade for JT Miller, what kind of offer would you have given? Do you think this offer would have been good enough for Vancouver to say yes to, instead of just waiting till the draft so that other teams would free themselves up the space on their roster and salary cap? Do you think your offer could have been better than any of these other teams? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. And bye.